All right, we've talked a little bit before about chemical versus physical change. A chemical reaction is something that can show old substances going away and new substances being formed. So um, we're going to be learning how to write and read chemical equations for chemical reactions. So for each of these changes below, go ahead and try to check and see whether you can see new substances being formed or whether it's just a physical change. So you can write a chemical equation for a physical change, but you will be able to see when you read that uh, equation, when you look at that reaction, that it's not actually a chemical change. It's not a chemical reaction. When you write chemical equations, we usually write a little subscript in parentheses that shows the state of the compound that we're talking about. G for gas, L for liquid, S for solid, or AQ meaning a solution of something dissolved in water, which is a common way for reactions to take place. I've seen a lot of uh, textbooks and other references that say, oh, well, you can tell the difference between a chemical and a physical change because chemical changes look more intense or happen faster or anything like that. And um, that's not true. I have some videos on Canvas where you can have a chemical change and a physical change looking extremely similar. So these are some indications that a chemical change could be happening, especially a color change. Formation of gas, of course, can be a chemical change or it can be a physical change. Something could be boiling and that would form a gas. Formation of a solid that could be a chemical change or it could be a physical change of something just freezing or something um, a super saturated solution having some solid precipitate out. So none of these are completely definitive. The definitive way to tell a chemical change is to see that new substances are being formed. So hopefully we can see here we have water as a liquid and water as a gas. This is the way you would write water boiling This is or water evaporating, but in any event, that's a physical change. And it would look like water boiling or water evaporating, depending on how fast this is happening. Here we have an acid dissolved in water that would just look like water. We also have baking soda, sodium bicarbonate dissolved in water. So this would just look like water. This would look like pouring two test tubes full of water together. And then these both look like water. Salt dissolved in water looks like water. Water looks like water. But this would be gas bubbles. So this would look like bubbles forming. This is one version of the vinegar baking soda reaction. This is not vinegar though. Any acid with baking soda will uh, produce violent foaming, violent bubble formation. However, you can also have violent bubble formation when you shake up a soda can and open the soda can and the CO2 that was dissolved, aqueous, it's in solution, now comes out as gas bubbles. So this would also look like bubbles. So these both look like bubbles or a foam forming. However, this would be a chemical change because the bubbles that are forming were not there before. This is a physical change. The bubbles that were dissolved are just becoming undissolved. So dissolving and undissolving, remember, is a physical change. So these two look very similar even though one's a chemical change and one's a physical change. Here we have something with, that looks like water and something that looks like water producing water and something else that looks like water. So this would not look like very much. This is a chemical change. The way you would tell that something's happening in this case is that you have an acid and a base reacting together and they produce uh, water, which is very energetically favorable. Um, if you're not familiar with this, you wouldn't know it, but I want to let you know that acid and base reacting together is very energetically favorable. So it wouldn't look like much, but heat would be generated. Your test tube would still look like a bunch of water is in here, but it would get warm. This is solid sodium chloride, salt, being added to water, it would just dissolve. So this would look like solid dissolving, which is a physical change. 
Here, let's look at this one first. This would look like the opposite of a solid dissolving. This one we have some things that are dissolved, so something that looks like water and something that looks like water mixed together. We get something that looks like water and something that does not look like water. We have a solid that's not dissolved in water. This could look cloudy. Um, some solid precipitates look like crystals. So what we would see here is cloudiness forming in something that had previously been clear. Um, I have a film of that, a little video of that on Canvas as well if you want to see that happening. I have a couple different examples of precipitate formation uh, linked on Canvas. This is a chemical change because the new solid was not one of the old things that you started with. Something new is forming. This one is kind of an interesting one. This is a physical change, something that is dissolved, becoming something that's not dissolved. So this is a physical change. And um, there's a very interesting video of this linked on Canvas. Instead of cloudiness, this is almost, it almost looks like ice is being formed because there's so much solid coming out that it becomes a solid block. You can see them pour and get like a little tower of solid from pouring that. So make sure you check that out. So I've saved this one for last because I did not talk about hydrate in the main lecture video of chapter six. It was in one of the supplemental videos. This is all a solid. Even though you see water as part of the chemical formula, that is the hydrate part of the chemical formula. This is a solid crystal that has water molecules inside the solid crystal. So what this looks like here are some blue solid crystals. This does not look like something that is dissolved. It is a solid. They are blue crystals, copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. So this formula is copper 2 sulfate. And then there are five water molecules for every copper, sulf copper 2 sulfate that we have. So this is copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. The reason why we write the formula this strange way with a little dot and then five in front of the water is that these waters are loosely bound. So we don't put the hydrogen and the oxygen as part of the copper 2 sulfate formula because these water molecules are separate from the copper 2 sulfate crystals. They're tucked inside there, but they are loosely bound. So if you heat this, you can drive off steam. The water molecules are released as gas, and then you get a different solid that is copper 2 sulfate, just plain copper 2 sulfate, with no water in there. That's why it's called anhydrous, because that means there's no water. And this solid looks a little bit different from this solid. That's why it makes an interesting demonstration because it goes from being a blue crystal to a white powder. We have a video linked of that on Canvas as well. So um, you can tell that something is changing. It's not the same solid it was before. The structure looks different. It's more powdery and the color is different as well. And this is a chemical change even though it's a little bit difficult to tell because it looks like you still have copper 2 sulfate, but copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate is a different substance than anhydrous copper 2 sulfate. So this is a chemical change. Even when we have chemical change, we have chemical equations that show new substances being formed and old ones going away, we still have to have conservation of mass. And so we can't have elements that are created or destroyed. So when we write a chemical reaction or a chemical equation, it should be balanced. It needs to have the same number of atoms of each element on both sides of the equation, both sides of the reaction. So the things on the left are the starting materials or the reactants. This arrow represents change taking place and these things written on the right are the products, what we end up with. In order to tell whether a reaction is balanced, you should list the elements that you see on both sides of the equation. So we see some hydrogen, some chlorine, some sodium. We already have hydrogen listed, some carbon, and some oxygen. Once you have these listed, go ahead and list them in the same order on the other side, just so that it's easier to compare. And then go ahead and count 
how many of each element you have on the left and on the right. So it looks like we have two hydrogens on the left, one chlorine, one sodium, one carbon, and three oxygens. On this side, we have two hydrogens as part of the water, one chlorine, one sodium, one carbon, and oxygen in these two compounds, two, and a third one, three. Then when we look at the elements, we can see that we, they all match. There's an equal number on the left and on the right. So this is balanced already as written. Let's take a look at this next equation. We have sodium, carbon, oxygen, calcium, and chlorine. And we'll write that on the other side in the same order. Here it looks like we have two sodium, carbon we have one, oxygen we have three, calcium we have one, and chlorine we have two. Here we have sodium one, carbon one, oxygen three, calcium one, and chlorine one. So some of these match, but some of them don't. In particular, I see that there's not enough sodium on this side. There should be two and there's one. And the same with chlorine. There should be two and there's one. What we can do about that is to increase the compound, increase one of the compounds here by putting a coefficient, a number in front of the compound here. So we can't change the formula of sodium chloride and make it sodium 2 chlorine 2. This is not sodium chloride. That's not the correct formula. We have to keep the same formula. However, what we can say is that we have two of this sodium chloride formula. So we can put a number in front of a compound. We can't change the formula of a compound, but we can put a number in front to increase how much we have of that compound. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's bump this amount of sodium chloride up to have two. If there's no number here, it's understood to be one. So we're going to increase this and make this two. That would bring us up to two sodium and two chlorine. And now it's balanced. So it wasn't balanced at first, but when we put the two in front of here, it became balanced. All right, let's keep going with these two reactions. We have some hydrogen and we have some oxygen on both sides of the equation. We have two hydrogen and two oxygen on the left, two hydrogen and one oxygen on the right. So we need more oxygen on the right. The only way to increase oxygen is to increase the number of water molecules. We're not gonna change the chemical formula of water we'll just make two of them. That will bring this up to four and it will make that two. Now we're doing okay for oxygen but we need more hydrogen here on the left. Again we can't change the formula of hydrogen but we can increase how many we have by putting a coefficient and that will bring it up to four. So once we change the coefficients it is balanced. It was not balanced at first. When we first did it, it was not balanced, but once we change the coefficients, it is now balanced. We have another reaction here with just two elements, and we have another case where it is not balanced at first. So let's go ahead and try fixing it. Well, I can see that we're going to have to increase the product, and I think that it could be done faster if you increase that first but maybe the first thing you notice is lithium because it's the first one listed. You can see that you need three of that. So you could go ahead and increase that. However, the nitrogen still needs to be increased. So we're going to have to increase our lithium nitride and have two of those. 
that's going to change both the nitrogen and the lithium. So now we're going to have to go back. Instead of having three lithium, we really need six. And now it is okay with six lithium, one molecule of nitrogen making two lithium nitride. So that is the basic back and forth. Try something and check it out is how you go balancing an equation. There are a few tips that might help out. I think the most helpful one is this last one for combustion. I'll show you how that one works. Sometimes if you have elements like hydrogen and oxygen that are in pretty much everything in the equation, then it helps to save those for the end or for later. Because if you balance your hydrogen, then the next thing you change is going to be out of balance again. Also, like the last example we saw, if an element occurs just as the element, like lithium, you might want to do that one last because as we saw, while we were balancing it, the need for lithium changed again. But you can always just change it a second time if you want. If you have something that's a polyatomic ion and it's the same on both sides of the arrow, like if you have a nitrate ion on both sides of the arrow, you can balance it as a nitrate ion together instead of balancing the nitrogen and oxygen separately. But you can always balance each element separately if you want to. Here we do have a nitrate example that we can take a look at that. And then we have a combustion example. I'll show you that combustion tip. This first equation has iron, oxygen, and carbon. So we have two, three, and one. And here we have one, two, and one. So since we have carbon and iron all alone, these are going to be easy to do at the end. We can adjust to however much carbon and iron we need. For this particular example, it might help to approach the oxygen first. So on one side, we have an odd number. On the other side, we have an even number. So I think we're going to have to double this so that we have six oxygens and triple this so that we have six oxygens. So um, I think that'll make it a little bit shorter to try that. So let's go ahead and double this and give ourselves six oxygen here. That's also going to give us four iron. And then we'll go ahead and triple this because that will give us six oxygen. Now we have that matching. And it also increases the carbon to three. So now getting three carbon on this side is easy. Carbon's all alone. We just put a three in front of there and it makes that three. And getting four iron is easy as well because iron's all alone. If we put a four here, we'll have four. So for that one, it was a little bit helpful to do the oxygen uh, first. So here, let's try that tip where the nitrate is just being balanced together. The NO3 stays together as one piece, both on the left side and on the right side of the equation. There's no other nitrogen or oxygen separating. If you want to balance the nitrogen and the oxygen as separate elements, you definitely can. I just want to show you how this looks. So on the left, we have one silver, one nitrate, one magnesium, and two chlorine. Here on the right, we have one silver, two nitrate, one magnesium, and one chlorine. So we need to increase the number of nitrate. We need to get two. So let's go ahead and put a two in front of the silver nitrate. That gives us two silver and two nitrate. So now our silver and our chlorine are too low here on the right. Let's try putting a two in front of that, which will give us two silver and two chlorine. So now at this point we have it balanced. All right, so for the combustion, the best technique is to go forwards, balancing carbon and hydrogen, and then come backwards and balance the oxygen last. So we're going to start out going forward because we definitely have more of everything, the carbon and hydrogen, on the left. So we need to go this way and increase the carbon and hydrogen. Let's go ahead and make two carbon dioxide because that will increase the carbon to two. It also increases the oxygen to five. We have four here and one here. Now to get six hydrogen, we're going to need three water molecules. That increases the hydrogen to six, and then it also increases the oxygen to seven. 
So now our carbon and hydrogen is done. We just have to go back and do the oxygen. Sometimes you'll have an even number of oxygen atoms that you need, which is easy because oxygen comes in pairs. And sometimes you'll have an odd number, like this time. We have seven oxygen that we need. If you have an odd number of oxygen atoms, then what you can do is put that number over two. So to get seven oxygen atoms, you're going to need seven halves or three and a half oxygen molecules. When you do that, you actually get seven oxygen atoms and the equation is balanced. But having a fraction as a coefficient is not what's normally seen for a chemical equation. So we're going to want to change this and the way we can do that is by doubling everything. So if you have an equal amount of each element on the left and on the right, then if you double everything, you should still have an equal amount on the left and on the right. And it should still be balanced. So let's go ahead and double everything. This becomes a 2. This becomes a 7 instead of 7 halves. It's just the actual number 7. This becomes a 4. Oh, I lost my 3. But this 3 becomes a 6. So now we've doubled everything and we can check and make sure that all of the elements are still balanced. Now we have four carbons, 12 hydrogens, and 14 oxygens. On this side, we have four carbons, 12 hydrogens, we have eight oxygens here, and six oxygens here. So altogether we have 14 oxygens. So when we doubled everything, our reaction stayed balanced, and now we have whole number coefficients instead of this fraction. So now we are all done with this combustion reaction. Let's take a look at classifying chemical reactions according to this five classification system. And then in the next lecture, we'll finish section 7.4 and look more closely at precipitation reactions and ionic equations. But let's at least look at these five types of chemical reactions because we have some assignments where we balance and classify some chemical reactions. The first thing you can do is count how many things you start with and how many things you end up with. If that number changes, you're going to have a combination or a decomposition. If you start with more than one and end up with just one, then the things are combining and that's a combination. If you start with just one and end up with more than one, then that's falling apart. That's a decomposition. The other types of chemical reaction have two things to start with and two things to end up with. So if you're starting with two things and ending with two things, then um, we have to take a closer look at these choices. Combustion is very specific. So if the two things you're starting with are a fuel and oxygen, and the two things you're ending with are carbon dioxide and water, then that is a combustion. So once you've seen that something starts with two things and ends with two things, check and see if you're burning fuel to make CO2 and water. If you are doing that, then that's a combustion. So if none of those apply, then we have to decide whether your reaction is a double displacement or a single displacement. If both of the things are compounds and they swap partners, so B used to be attached to C, a cation and an anion, and then we have another cation and anion, if they trade anions, so instead of anion C, B ends up with anion E, and D starts out with anion E and ends up with anion C, if they're swapping partners, that's a double displacement. A single displacement is when an element and a compound just swap one partner. You have a single and a compound, and you end up with a different single and a different compound. So that single shows you that it's a single displacement. If B is a metal, it's going to trade places with the metal, the cation. It's going to trade places with C. If B is a nonmetal, then it's going to trade places with the nonmetal and replace the anion D. 
So there are two different ways you can see a single displacement. Let's take a look at some specific examples and see if we can classify them. So the first thing to do here is see that we are starting with one thing and we are ending with two things, more than one thing. So the thing that we're starting with, mercury 2 oxide, is falling apart to create just mercury and just oxygen. And this would be called a decomposition. One thing going to more than one thing. Here we have two things to start with and two things to end with. So we know it's not a decomposition and it's also not a combination. Then we take a look and see, do we have a fuel and oxygen making carbon dioxide and water? No, then it's not a combustion. So our last two choices are double displacement and single displacement. What we're starting with are a compound and a single element, and what we end with are a different compound and a different single element. So these single elements here let us know that it is a single displacement. Since zinc is a metal, it replaces the metal copper in this compound. And so instead of copper sulfate, we now have zinc sulfate. And instead of zinc alone, we now have copper alone. All right, this reaction here, we have two things going to two things. So it's not a decomposition or a combination. And then we look, is it a fuel and oxygen going to carbon dioxide and water? Yes, it is. So this is a combustion. All right, here we again have two things going to two things. It's not a decomposition. It's not a combination. We also don't have a fuel and oxygen going to carbon dioxide and water. So it's not a combustion. Our remaining choices are single displacement and double displacement. Since both of these are compounds and they swap partners to become two other compounds, there's no single elements here, then this is a double displacement. And here we're looking at one thing going to more than one thing, and so that is a decomposition. So even though there is carbon dioxide and water here, it's not a combustion because we are not combining a fuel with oxygen. We have one thing falling apart to make more than one thing. So that is a decomposition. The rest of section 7.4 will be in the next lecture. So this is the end of this one for now.